Welcome to the Drug Classroom Podcast. In this episode, I spoke with Lynn Albrecht. She's the mother of Ross Albrecht, who founded Silk Road. Silk Road was one of the first major darknet markets, which was often used for selling drugs. He was arrested and later sentenced to life in prison. Given the nature of the case, I disagree with the sentencing, and I think it highlights problems with our justice system. We spoke about the Silk Road case, Ross's imprisonment, and how the government oversteps its bounds. As always, if you want to support The Drug Classroom, you can find donation options at thedrugclassroom.com slash support. TDC is only funded by donations, so your support is greatly appreciated. I'm here with Lynn Albrecht. Lynn, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you. Happy to be here. I've followed the case of your son, Ross, for now at least three, four years. And it's always been hard to believe that even under significant public scrutiny and a lot of media coverage that somebody was essentially for running a website sentenced to life in prison. And we're mainly going to talk about the case and the implications. But can you give some background idea of what Ross, you know, who he is, the background prior to Silk Road? Because a lot of people just think of him as the creator of a drug market. And it's pretty clear he was a bit more than that and is a bit more than that. Well, yeah, the judge would not allow anything (laughs) except drugs to be mentioned as far as what was sold on the site, uh, that was a limitation in the trial. So there were many legal things sold too. Now, I'm not saying there weren't a lot of drugs sold on the site, but it would, his libertarian views were not allowed to be mentioned to the jury. It was basically a very highly controlled narrative that, that was presented to the jury about who Ross was and what Silk Road was. And I'm not really here to defend Silk Road or drugs or drug use at all. But, you know, I think it's very important in a trial to have all the information made known to the jury. And Silk Road was a lot more than a drug site. And in fact, Ross has told me that he did not intend it to be a drug site per se. It was designed to protect, to be a marketplace that protected the anonymity and privacy of its users. It was essentially product agnostic. It was within, there were restrictions that created victims that were not voluntary, such as child pornography was not permitted. Uh, Stolen property, for another example, was not permitted. But if it was a voluntary act between two people, two adults, it was considered okay. That was their choice. Now we can argue about that. People can argue about that, but that was the intention. Um, and it, I think a lot of people who did buy and sell drugs were attracted to the anonymity, um, but it wasn't designed to be a drug site, per se. And the the views he still holds, I assume, and the ones that sort of influenced creating this kind of marketplace would seem especially relevant because in criminal justice, you're trying to figure out, is this person going to be a problem later on? And if they're going into something that ends up related to drugs, but in that kind of way, then it kind of tells you and would tell the jury that this person, if they were let out, probably is not going to harm anybody. And instead of allowing information about his political views or the intention of the site into the case, they allowed other information, which we'll get into, which painted a terrible picture of him and really led the jury to believe that he is sort of a kingpin-like individual. And it's just amazing to see sort of the defense run over in that way because it just doesn't fit with any of the descriptions that I've seen of Ross on a personal level, how people in the case would have been, or in the jury would have been viewing him. You know, how frustrating was that to see day after day the person you know misrepresented in such a significant way? Oh, horribly frustrating. Um, And Ross is very frustrated. He really wanted to testify. He really wanted to speak out. He's had wanted to speak out since, but he's been advised by multiple lawyers not to, as long as he's in the process of fighting for his freedom through the legal system. uh, Because I I don't know, you you have to make the decision. Am I going to take the advice from my lawyers or not? And, you know, he has chosen to do that. And I, I support that decision. However, you know, if people I mean, there's 100 letters officially submitted to the court on our website from people who know almost all of them from people who personally know Ross attesting to his character 
There is nothing in there that would lead anyone to think he was a danger. And in fact, quite the opposite. It's quite, I don't know that, I certainly don't know that I could get a hundred letters about me written that way. It's really impressive what Ross, who he is and what he's done. And the thing is, he was 26 years old. He was very idealistic. He had worked in the Ron Paul campaign. He was very caught up in Austrian economics and the idea of free markets. To put someone like that, and you know, it's like the whole criminal justice system calls itself correctional. I don't see any corrections being, I don't see that at all from my personal experience. In fact, I think that it's almost designed to create criminals because if you're in in a place where you have to survive in um, basically with violent people, you know, you have to toughen up. And Ross is still himself. He's still, but I worry about that. I, you know, but in any case, it's not just Ross, and I really want to make this clear, and you probably know that life sentences and harsh sentences and excessive sentences have, but specifically life sentences have quintupled since the 80s and the drug war, quintupled. And when I was growing up, you hardly ever heard about a life sentence. And if you did, it was someone, you know, mass murderer or something, that someone that was truly a threat to people, that there was no chance of rehabilitation. Now, you know, you don't even have to actually sell drugs in Ross's case. You have to have created a platform that allows other people to do that. But it's not, you know, like I say, it's not just Ross. I mean, he knows a guy in there he's told me about, and it's one of many, a named Tony, who uh, is serving life in a federal prison for selling marijuana 20 years ago. He's already done 20 years. And he's still in there with a life sentence for marijuana, ironically, in a state where it is now legal. This is really evil. It's, and I see the repercussions, of course, in our own family, but also in um, the family, the other families who I get to know when I visit. And it's devastating. And it, the, the children of these people, and I, I do understand, you know, you have to keep truly dangerous people. You have to keep the public protected from them. Although I don't know that you could always say that there's no chance of rehabilitation, but okay, I get that. I do. But uh, drug, nonviolent drug offenses, which make up over 60% of the prison population now, this is wrong. I don't know if I answered your question. I have went off a of very Well, it's especially like wrong for drugs and, and, you know, there's other mm-hmm. crimes like prostitution that lead to mm-hmm. excessive sentencing. You know, even for the worst crimes, you have other countries like in Europe, which sometimes limit sentencing to a max of, say, 20 years. And if someone is truly not rehabilitated by then, they can stay in. But the idea of a life sentence, deciding that somebody when they were 20 or 25 and they did something, even if it was truly wrong and hurt somebody, that they should have 80 more years taken away, no matter how their life changes, is sort of fundamentally wrong. And it goes against the idea of changing people and creating a safer society, there's certain people in jail that are so clearly not a threat to society, and Ross would be one of them. But he was arrested initially, and then things were presented in the trial that did make him seem like somebody who could harm people. There were these claims about supposed murder for hire. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Because it's one of the only things that when you make the argument still to this day that this is a terrible case and Silk Road was not this horrible thing, regardless of what you think about drugs, it shouldn't lead to a life sentence. People usually respond with, oh, but he tried to have people killed. And they seem to not understand that this was not really something that was even part of the case. True. Um, well, I wouldn't say it wasn't part of the case, but it wasn't charged at trial. And uh, there, I'm, I'm always wondering, why not? I mean, if isn't that worth charging at trial? And instead, what the government did was talk about it. The defense objected to that, said, look, it hasn't even been charged. We don't have a chance to defend against it. You're, you have to bring a charge so that the defendant can say, you know, defend against it. And the judge allowed it. This is a problem. And apparently it's not just, again, unique to Ross. I actually have personally corresponded with another person. This is a long time ago that is serving life for a drug, nonviolent drug offense. And they did the same thing to him to paint the picture of this dangerous thug. Now, uh, there is an indictment in Maryland 
that's been sitting there for literally almost four years. They have not prosecuted it. They've never prosecuted this charge ever. They have not prosecuted it. They're just letting it sit there. And it includes basically a murder for hire charge that was based on the testimony of Karl Mark Force, who was a corrupt, a admitted corrupt agent who is now in prison, who was all over the site, had the ability to do all kinds of things, including create chats, delete chats, act as DPR, in fact. And it's based on him and he's in prison. And yet this remains. And I, even this morning, a woman tweeted me and said, he's not in there for drugs. He's in there for planning a murder. And I'm like, you know, that is absurd. He wasn't even charged with that for trial, you know, but the ignorance and of course the media loves the murder for hire because it's very sensationalistic. You know, it's just, it's very difficult because they just say stuff and do the government's work for them that they don't have to do in a courtroom where they actually have to prove something. They just um, say it. And then the media, a lot of the media, not everyone parrots it. This is a of concern because I don't think people, I didn't realize that you can be actually sentenced or it can affect your sentence. And the appellate court said it did this charge without even having it come to trial. They can just accuse you without anything, any proof, nothing. The other point is all of the information about it is digital. I've been told by many crypto security experts that you can tamper with digital evidence and there's no trace. There is no way to tell. And actually, after Ross was arrested, another dread pirate, a dread pirate Roberts signed in to the Silk Road Forum using that account which you know, makes you wonder who was that. So there's no way to say it was Ross who said any of these things. And there's evidence of tampering in the um, evidence. A big portion was deleted and it looks like it was another corrupt agent. And that, you know, who knows what else is, is there if we knew all the truth. So I know it's a tough PR battle. It really is. And um, even uh, one publication called it a murder mystery. No one was murdered. They act like Ross actually killed someone. But And another point is that even if it's true, which it's not, and Ross says it's not, and I believe it's not, and there's no proof of it and all of that, uh, murder for hire when there's no victim and there's no murder is 10 years. So it still doesn't, <laughs> how can it possibly justify a double life sentence plus 40 years? It's, yeah. um, you know, no one died. And I don't believe that Ross was involved in it at all. He told me he's not. He said he was shocked when he saw it. Doesn't know how it happened, but it's very easy to manipulate digital evidence. It's easy to put things on laptops, take them off, tamper with them. In fact, a crypto person told me it was child's play. So, uh, And it would be the perfect that. thing to corrupt yeah. the jury's view of him. I mean, if you could throw in just one extra piece of evidence to really paint his character in a negative light, that mm -hmm. would be the thing. It was no longer drugs or philosophy or an open marketplace. Right. It was... He tried to have people killed. And mm -hmm. even in otherwise respectable media sources, I've seen people mm. try to paint him in a way that suggests he was some digital kingpin and over time became power hungry. And he right. was just like any other mob boss or something going around mm -hmm. trying to get rid of his enemies. And it becomes this sensationalist story. And, and it's frustrating in the media. And then it's life changing it when the jury believes that. Right. So setting aside those things, what was he actually he got this life sentence for what? What were the actual charges he ended up having? Yeah, and they're listed in technical language on our website. I just want to say something about the um, otherwise respectable media, um, which that could be debated. But I actually said to one of them, I said, so do you really think Ross is dangerous? I mean, would you be afraid to go into a room alone with Ross? And he goes, no, I'd love to. Could you set up that interview? I mean, it's ridiculous. They know he's not dangerous. They know that. And it's obvious he's not a threat. Now, whether or not on a, his computer, he got caught up in something. And I don't believe it, I, I, like I said. But let's hypothetical. When you're 26 years old and you're only on a computer, it was not like, you know, a life sentence. You don't think you cannot grow this. You cannot, you know, be rehabilitated at all. In any case, they know he's, I, I don't believe anyone including the government, actually thinks Ross is dangerous. I don't. The judge said in her sentencing, it's obvious you started this site for philosophical reasons, and I'm not sure that's a philosophy you've given up. She had directly attacked his the philosophy of the site, which is basically libertarian and voluntarist, and um, Ross's political beliefs. This is 
outrageous. This is an offense to the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, as far as what he was actually uh, convicted for, and that changed, by the way, because by the time it was the sentencing, they had said, oh, well, that's some of those are redundant. So he was actually sentenced for two less charges. I mean, results in the same thing, which does point to another thing the government does which was they pile on charges, they pile on accusations. So that really, you know, the jury's like, whoa, you know, and then, well, it's redundant. Well, this is the way they word it. And then by the time it comes around to sentencing, they go, oh, well, we can drop that. We can drop that because really it's, and so it's a, it's a manipulative tactic in a trial to do that. But um, I think I should probably pull up our website to be totally accurate. But in general, there was, um, well, there was the, Criminal continuing criminal enterprise, which is basically the kingpin charge. To call Ross a kingpin because he was a website host is really a distortion. Actually, I'm going. I have a. I've been researching other quote unquote kingpins. They're all violent. They're all or they're accused of being violent. I, I don't know. I never know if what's it's really true, but they're accused of being violent with that. Sometimes hundreds of people. Ross was. They never really accused him of being violent. There's nothing about it. This is actually a whole new, this is like a 21st century, quote unquote, kingpin. It's web, web kingpin, you know, but it's not really a kingpin. And also they never really even mentioned, they didn't, as far as I can see, meet the um, requirements of that charge because it requires you name five people who worked for the kingpin directly and they never named any actual names. Um, (laughs) One person can have five identities on that that site or, you know, 50 people can use the Dread Pirate Roberts handle. I mean, it's all, but anyway, so it was the kingpin charge, which has its own life sentence, the trafficking in narcotics, which has a life sentence in her, you know, because of the judge, they could have, the judge could have given Ross the mandatory minimum of 20 years, which is very long, (laughs) very, very long for someone in their twenties that 20 years. And she chose instead to, and he would have put him in a medium security prison which is much safer place, but instead she it won't be happy till he leaves that prison as a corpse, and um, she has placed him in a place with violent gangs and other violent people, um, which is dangerous. So those are the two main charges, and then they threw in um, conspiracy. You know, the government uses conspiracy charges to. Hey, I think any of us could be probably (laughs) uh, charged with conspiracy of one sort or another, but um, conspiracy to hack into computers because some people sold uh, what could be used as hacking software on the site. Not that Ross hacked anybody. Conspiracy to make false IDs. Same thing. Conspiracy. What was the other thing? Money laundering. And they always the, the government, you know, money laundering is almost like routine in these cases. So. Those were the charges. And the implication is that a kingpin's violent, but there were no specific violent allegations at all, charged at trial or proven at all, just talked about by the prosecution to the jury as if it were true. They, they said, you know, you don't have to, it hasn't been proven. You don't have to rule on this, but he did it. Now, I'm sorry, I don't see how that's fair. We're supposed to be innocent until proven, keyword, guilty, proven guilty, not just the government says you're guilty. And this was life in prison without parole. Yeah, the federal, well, the federal system took away parole in the 80s again during, well, I don't know if it was because of the drug war, but it was at the time of the drug war. So anyone convicted of a federal crime gets no parole. Another horrible, evil thing. No chance. And I remember seeing the judge effectively defended the sentencing based on defending the drug war. And you add that to critiquing his political beliefs. And it's no wonder why people now view him practically as a political prisoner. It's moved so far beyond the site to this terrible use of the justice system to prosecute somebody based upon propping up a larger federal drug war. And it doesn't matter the consequences for an individual person, even though that should be exactly what a trial is about. It's not about defending the policies of a nation, but figuring out if an individual person is a danger to society. And it seems like these justice systems are taking it upon themselves to go around and at any means, prop up the drug war for just because they believe it's a good idea. Uh, Yeah, you make a couple of very good points. One is they said that he had to serve as an example because he was the first to use the internet in this way, quote unquote, that he did this first and that, um, and because it's high profile, 
he must be an example. Now, first of all, I agree. We're supposed to be tried as individuals in this country. We're not some tool. So that alone is very unfair in my mind. There is no law that says that because you're the first to do something, you should be take the burden for everyone following you. It is, in fact, kind of uh, illogical because the first person doesn't really know what they're getting into. The second person does. And in fact, Blake Benthal, who ran and admitted to running Silk Road 2.0, which in a mo- given month sold four times as many drugs as Silk Road, is a free man. He was released. I found out. I had to dig and dig to find out where is this guy. He is free. He was released in November of 2014. And I'm not saying I want him in jail. I, I'm saying we should have equal treatment under the law. And in fact, it's the law to have equal treatment under the law. So that shows me it's political. Because it, if they think Ross is so dangerous that he can never get out of prison, why isn't Blake Benthal so dangerous that he shouldn't be out of prison? Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, hello, the biggest drug dealer on Silk Road got 10 years and it goes down from there. The biggest cocaine and heroin seller got five. The biggest meth seller got three. You know, it's on and on. And um, the other thing you bring up that I think is a really good point is apparently in the courts now, there's what's called a drug exception, which is basically, well, if it's about drugs, the Constitution goes out the window. We make an exception for drug cases and we don't have to follow the Constitution. This is one way the drug war is eroding our rights, eroding our protections. And the more I learn about it and the more I see, it's obvious that the drug war is not about stopping people from using drugs. Uh, if it were, that biggest drug dealer in Silk Road you know, would have gotten a longer sentence. I'm not saying I want him to. Be, I want to be clear. But the other thing is that um, it's been 40, over 45 years now. It's been over a trillion dollars to try to stop people from using drugs. And the only results I see of this is increased government power, erosion of our constitutional protections, and people making a lot of money off of human beings who are being put in cages. And I really, I see this as human trafficking. I don't see, if you make money off of human beings, how is that not human trafficking? And they are, it's a huge industry. It's the reason why the criminal, uh, excuse me, the uh, criminal, uh, the prison guard unions, they're one of the main lobbyists against legalization. One of the other ones is the police unions. It's a jobs program. It's, I mean, when I go to see Ross in this place that he is now in Colorado, it's state of the art, enormous. I can't even imagine how many multiple, multiple millions of dollars have gone into building it, to running it to maintaining it. It's a huge enterprise that many towns all around there depend upon. It's entrenched as an industry and the product, the inventory is human beings. It's also a terrible system because it's really just a money-making machine in the sense that they don't have to, you know, create a better product that makes society safer. It's really just a matter of setting up some businesses to, you know, either enforce the laws or keep the prisons secure or building the prisons. And then you can modulate the amount of money being made just based upon enforcement of policy. And when you have an entire industry based around how much you're enforcing policies, of course, you're going to have massive opposition to a more just liberal system. Yeah, so the money angle is pretty significant. Even if Silk Road was just about selling drugs and there was no other angle to it, it would still be a a terrible case. But Silk Road, compared to even some other sites, was respectable in some ways because it had a more clear harm reduction angle. I mean, there was a doctor on the site who answered questions. There was a community that had developed around it. And you see this time and time again in Prohibition where the government steps in to criminalize a certain kind of drug-related activity, and all that happens as a result is making the activity worse. So you criminalize drugs, and then you end up making the drugs more dangerous, or you ban a new research chemical, and then the ones that come out after are even worse. Or in the case of Silk Road, you get rid of Silk Road, and the ones that come after are not as good, whereas Silk Road could be more easily considered, in my opinion, a harm reduction approach because you take out the violence from the market to a significant degree 
and you have a community for education and reviews. So there's all these interesting elements to it that obviously no jury or, or judge is likely to care about, but it really is, I think, a kind of harm reduction. And that was one of the worst parts about seeing it taken down because I could see how Silk Road and even other markets are actually potentially saving lives. Meanwhile, in the case, they focused on the potential lives that were endangered or killed as a result of drugs sold on the site, which is when you start blaming Ross for facilitating drug sales that may have killed somebody way down the line, that's a really odd argument to make when there's a clearer argument that it's actually a form of harm reduction. I don't know if you agree with that evaluation of Silk Road, but it's how I've felt about the case for, for years. Well, yeah, and there's academic papers uh, supporting that. As regards people who died as a result of drugs allegedly bought on Silk Road, and by the way, we hired a, a pathologist at the sentencing because this was the government brought in two grieving parents of people who had died uh, on Silk Road, um, and I felt for them. Of course, you, you, it's it's heartrending, but I don't see how this has a place in a sentencing in a tr- courtroom. It's totally emotional, and I wasn't at trial. It wasn't proven. And actually, the pathologist said there's absolutely no way to prove that that those drugs were from Silk Road or that, you know, they even two of them died of drugs at all. And yet this was brushed aside by the judge. Look, at some point, you know, we can go into alcohol and cigarettes and all the stuff. At some point, people make choices. It's not that I don't feel horrible for people who die of alcohol or people who die. I mean, it's it's awful. But at the same time, it's like blaming the landlord of a liquor store if your kid goes and buys alcohol and then gets in a car, a car wreck and kills someone or dies. It's really getting to be that the source of responsibility gets pretty distant. Now, again, I'm not defending it. I'm not going to defend Silk Road. I, I, I definitely see the people, I understand the people who think it was a bad thing, but there is a harm reduction argument too. So I think there's a debate that could be had, but to ca- to have the person who allegedly, I mean, I think the trial was a travesty and Ross says he wasn't running the site for all the time they said, and there's a whole other angle to this, but in any case, he was convicted for, uh, is really stretching it. I mean, Amazon is being sued, or was, by a mother of a do- her daughter who bought cyanide on Amazon and used it to kill herself. She's also suing the vendor. And, um, you know, I don't see the law being applied equally here. Jeff Bezos certainly isn't being hauled into court for that death. Mm-hmm. In, in addition, the government had the server during the time when at least two of those people died that were brought up in sentencing, and they chose not to take down the site. They chose to keep it up and continue to allow people to exchange drugs. Are they responsible too? It really gets to be a pretty big stretch. And also, within drug charges is built in the fact that potentially someone will overdose on a drug bought. But every drug dealer is not given life for people dying because it's already built in and it's not life. Um, The other uh, point about Silk Road being different is that, as I mentioned, there were rules. Now, it was open. It was not closely regulated, but there were rules stated that if it wasn't a voluntary exchange, for instance, in child pornography. I mean, I read in the the, um, media there was child pornography on there. I'm like, oh my God, even the government doesn't say that, but they just say it, you know? And it's it's just, um, no, there wasn't because of course that's not voluntary. And um, just one example, there were several things that were against the rules. So there was some, you know, there was an ethical component that I don't believe is present in, I don't go on the dark net. I don't know what's up there. I just read about it and sometimes and uh doesn't sound like there's very many limitations at all. But people are going to do bad things, you know? It's like, anyway, I, I'd be, I, would, I would feel more strongly about them going after people who trafficked in, in children than uh, people who traffic in drugs that are a voluntary interaction. And in fact, the government recently dropped uh, the playpen case, which was child pornography, because they didn't want to reveal their methods. So they don't seem to mind that there's these child pornographers, allegedly child pornographers out there preying on children. But, you know, even by the FBI data, they've arrested more or they have more people under arrest for marijuana use, possession, than all violent crimes combined. It's low hanging fruit to arrest drug people and fill the prisons. It's not like they're protecting us. 
If that's true, which is an FBI statistic, I don't see how they're protecting us. The responsibility angle is clear, and it's unfortunate because so many people always view drug cases as everybody who is affected by drugs in a negative way, no matter how that harm came about. And it is terrible if somebody is yeah, hurt or killed because of drugs, but there is still responsibility. And if it's going to lie anywhere, it's not going to be on the side of somebody who sold the drug, in my opinion, unless it's something like, you know, you sold heroin and it had fentanyl and then somebody died because of that. Well, that's an issue. That's misrepresentation. And then you're creating a way for people to die unknowingly. But if you're selling stuff and it actually is what you claim, then everything after that should be basically the responsibility of the person. And it definitely would not be the responsibility of a site owner. And as you point out, you have other sites like Amazon or Facebook or Craigslist that have all at some point facilitated criminal activity. And we're not going around blaming site owners for that. So to sort of draw this line and say, the second that drugs become fairly significant on a site, that's when the site owner takes full responsibility. I mean, that is totally arbitrary. And this case ends up creating precedent for how to handle site owners in the future, which is quite concerning because the case was handled so terribly. And it's not a good precedent, I would think, to have in the legal system. You don't want site owners to be blamed for every piece of activity their users engage in. So that kind of manner of applying responsibility to the highest person on the chain for everything that takes place below them is disturbing. Absolutely. I mean, uh, people have written about how it will put a chill on the internet because people are not going to want to be held criminally liable for what's on their site. And actually, in civil cases, they're not. In, if, if this were a civil case and Ross were being sued in a civil court, he would be totally exonerated because in the civil case, it's not considered valid to blame a site owner for what's on the site. But since it's a criminal case, it's a different standard. And yeah, you make a really good point. And it isn't just, uh, you know, I mentioned Amazon, but Facebook lives had murders on there. And uh, Google has facilitated uh, jihadi terrorist activity. And uh, you can go on and on. Craigslist, of course, is known for people, you know, being murdered, <laughs> meeting through Craigslist. I mean, it, and drugs being dealt and all kinds of things. So it's like, it's very arbitrary. And even within the Silk Road case itself, it's hugely arbitrary. And, um, you know, so that makes me think it's political. So. And the appeal uh, this year, I believe, was lost. And when I was reading through the mm -hmm. information about it, there was this interesting angle that the court took where they were saying, it's possible we will one day regard these policies mm -hmm. as tragic mistakes and adopt less punitive policies. But oh, in the meantime, we're just going to enforce mm -hmm. them as strongly as possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, to read that and to say, that means these people believe this person was engaging in an activity that in five or 10 years may not even be illegal anymore because it already is appearing quite immoral to have these policies mm -hmm. be in place. But for now, it's fine to ruin as many individual lives for their entire lives as we can because, hey, that's the policy and we have to mm -hmm. stick to it. That's a very exactly. concerning angle to take. Yeah. I agree. I, I, I was like, OK, <laughs> so slavery, it was OK until it wasn't legal. And then it's, you know, it's like, where where is the <clears throat> I don't know if the, the appellate court had the power to do this because it was what they said it was within the judge's discretion to give him life. Well, it shouldn't be there shouldn't be allowed to have life sentences for first time offenders, especially nonviolent. I don't think. And, you know, I've talked to Ross about this and he said, yeah, it's kind of old fashioned to continue to put people basically in dungeons. I mean, nicer. They're nicer than a dungeon, I guess. But it's still a cage. It's old fashioned. It's kind of like we're in the 21st century. Can't we do something a little more effective and creative? And it, for instance, for nonviolent people, why not put an ankle bracelet on them? Let them go out and make restitution to people. You know, if someone stole my car, I'd rather instead of just warehousing them at my taxpayer's expense, I'd rather they were out and paying me back personally. And warehousing 
in an environment which is going to maximize the aggressiveness and your interaction with worse criminals who could push you in a bad direction. And that's the common story that we hear is 16-year-old goes in there because they were arrested for cannabis possession or selling cannabis, Mm -hmm. and suddenly they're getting introduced to a gang. So when they get out at 22, they're in a far worse life of crime than they would have been. And this is handled differently in other countries. Norway, for example, for a large portion of its prisoners, they're not kept in these horrible environments. It's not meant to maximize how horrible their life is. It's meant to maximize their likelihood of being better when they get out. And you would want to have increased autonomy for the prisoners so they're able to go throughout the prison and engage in activities and talk with people. And it's not lockdown type situation because that's not going to be good for increasing their social interaction. When they get out, they're going to be more antisocial than they were going in. And there's just all these ways in which the American system seems to maximize in the name of punishment, not justice, the mm-hmm. the horrible you know nature of their living situation. You know, what is it like for Ross? Because he was transferred recently. What is the prison like where he's at compared to before? And what is his mm-hmm. daily life like? Yeah. Let me just say a little something about what you just said, though. Um, you know, Congress, in, supposedly in an attempt to remedy the sentencing excesses, uh, passed the Sentencing Reform Act in the 80s, and it says a sentence would be sufficient but no longer than necessary. And yet, and it's so obvious in Ross's case, it, it is not necessary. Um, but it doesn't seem to be being followed. And like I said, life sentences have quintupled. Another thing that they took away, along with parole, is conjugal visits in the federal system. It's allowed in the state. Well, of course, we have families who are suffering here that are are split apart that, um, you know, and that's the other thing. It's like it destroys families. It's not just um, what it does to the inmate, which is awful. So families, you know, they lose their family often. And um, the children are very badly impacted. And it's statistically shown that they're more likely to end up in a cage, too. They're more likely to follow in the footsteps. And I met, I mean, I've met so many families and I just really feel like I'm speaking for them as well. One mom, she's like, my kids had straight A's before. Now they're failing. I'm having all kinds of problems. I, you know, they're, these poor people are trying to hold things together. You know, life's hard anyway, but with this situation, you know, especially when it's a nonviolent crime and and so it's not only hurting them, the inmate, but it's 2.9 million kids in this country. It's a lot of kids are are being set up to to be criminals, quote unquote, in the in the system. As regards where Ross is now, um, except for the violence, which he has not been the victim of violence at this point. Uh, Ross is very personable. He likes people. He he isn't. He's smart. He doesn't get involved in stuff. Uh, I don't know, you know, that's a little con- very concerning for me as far as how long you can do that. But in any case, uh, where he was before in New York was a, is designed to be transitional. So it's the resources, the space, it's all pretty bad. And in fact, the U.N. has called it torture, that particular facility. And El Chapo's lawyers, El Chapo was there and his lawyer said this is cruel and unusual. Well, that's where Ross lived for three and a half years. The place he is now, as I mentioned, millions and trillions, not trillions, millions, multiple millions of dollars have gone into it, which makes for a very big and decent facility. And one of the best things about it for him is that he can go outside. He wasn't able to, he's very outdoorsy, loves nature, and he was not able to get outside to breathe fresh air and feel the sun, except to, if he was lucky, a couple of hours a week on the roof of a Manhattan building. And a lot of times they canceled it. So he, you know, now he can go outside every day, watch the sunrise, see the mountains. I mean, walk a track, you know, be outside and feel the air, you know. And so that for him has felt like a re- increase in freedom, even though it's behind a, a, you know, three layers of razor wire. It's also he said the food's a little better. <laughs> the food's better. Um, he also, I think, the law library. He spends a lot of time in the law library and. Um, he said that that's, uh, you know, I think it's a better better law library. Um, 
And I think just activities and facilities are, are better. There's more programs. He was invited to be in a fine arts program, um, which he was really wanting to do, but it falls on a visiting day and he doesn't want to give up any visits. And, uh, so he, he's not doing that, but, um, you know, there's different options. So in that sense, it's, it's better. But as far as the people in there, you know, in, in New York, it's just a, a real mix and it wasn't any threat of violence at all. In this place, there are, this is where they put their, except for the supermax, which is like the, you know, most, you know, dangerous people, you know, and those people are kept in solitary all the time, pretty much. I think they get to see a guard one hour a day. And otherwise they're in solitary. I mean, it's extreme. He's not there, <laughs> but um, the next level down where they put their most dangerous people. And I've had, I've talked to families, uh, wives and, and saying their husband was stabbed there. They were uh, kicked in the head so badly they had to be brought to the hospital for concussions. I mean, it's, it's pretty brutal in there. And Ross is, you know, he's just a peaceful guy. You know, he's not, he's, he's, he has not been prepared for this kind of thing. I think he's, he's hanging in there, but it's, it's not where he should be. And I don't know if I mentioned, I may, I didn't, that they have a designation score system in this prisons where, you know, based on your past activities and, and actions, they rate you as how, where you should go. And Ross rates so low that he would be put, even with the charges that add points, he would go into a low security. One point, he's one point up from a camp, which has no fence. But because of the sentence that the judge gave him, he's automatically put in a maximum security prison. So, I mean, she has condemned him not only to life, but life in a, um, you know, a dangerous place. It's pretty upsetting to see all opinion and discretion taken away from the system so that just the decisions of one or two people along the way can basically determine how an entire life is now going to be spent. And, mm -hmm. you know, you would think even if there was no way for him to get out, there would be some kind of system where his living standards could improve, you know, petition for that based upon his conduct yeah. in there and then his, his life before. And all of those things would tell you that Ross should not be in there and there's no reason to increase the chance that he's going to be, you know, if something ever happened, whether it's to him or to somebody else, you have people who are going in and they're only going to be there for 10 years or 20 years or life, but then it turns into a case of torture or worse because you're intentionally putting them in a case where mm -hmm. they, they, they could be harmed. I mean, that should never be the way that a prison is set up. And the only reason we seem to get there is because these people, no matter their crimes, just the fact that they're in prison means that they're basically less than human. The normal standards of living just don't apply. And it's really sad to see that that judge could basically condemn him to this being his life. And because the appeal was lost, where do things stand now? Is there any step forward to try and change anything to get him out, to reduce the sentence to anything? Yeah, they're, they're well in the system. The next step is to petition the Supreme Court. They take about 1% of the petitions. And so Ross is preparing to do that. In the Supreme Court, you don't go back and talk about your trial and all that. It has to be issues that affect everyone. And there's plenty of them in this. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, what we are now, that's our hope and hope gets slimmer, but it's, there's still hope. The other thing is as far as changing his, where he is, you know, he, even his, uh, counselor there said, you should, you need to be in a medium security. You shouldn't be in here. I mean, it's obvious when you meet him, they, when he came, they go, what are you doing in here? And then they go, oh, the sentence, that's why they know he doesn't belong there. But they can't, they don't have the power to change that. Um, the Bureau of Prisons can, but, you know, <laughs> they haven't. He was told by his case manager that in seven years, he can maybe get changed. Now, I'm not willing to accept that. Uh, I'm hoping that we can get, make that happen sooner so that he can have at least a better life and, a less, and not be under threat. But um, it's a very slow-moving uh, bureaucracy. So, you know, that's, I'll be working on that as well. It's just on all different fronts. We're, we're still, we're not giving up at all.
So I can't, you know, I can't, uh, you know, be live my life and know that Ross is, I can't desert him. I can't do that. So, and, and I really, you know, people, some people have written to me on the internet, oh, you're so selfish. You only care about Ross and you don't care about, I try every time I speak publicly, every time that to bring up, and I did today, the other people, this is not just about Ross. This is a human rights crisis and a national disgrace what's going on. And it's not just about Ross at all. And when I get him out, when we finally can, Ross is released, I would continue to, as long as people want to hear what I have to say, talk about it because it's, it's, it's a serious situation. And I, and I see our rights being eroded through the use of the drug war and it's alarming. So it's not just about Ross. How have his political views or just views on really anything changed as a result of being in there? I mean, it sounds like he's basically the same person and uh, and hopefully it remains that way, but have things changed with his way of thinking about stuff, not necessarily uh, believing that what he did do was right, but his general philosophy and everything, is that basically the same? Um, well, the short answer I'd say is yes, that um, Ross has always been someone who believes in freedom and um, that has not changed. And I do too. And so did our founding fathers. And so do a lot of people. I would say though, that he and I both and our family have matured in the sense of seeing what the reality of losing what our losing our freedoms is i was frankly i wasn't a big fan of government before but i was shocked at how ross was investigated tried sentenced i have been shocked i mean even now i hear things unrelated to his case but some kind of government abuse or corruption and i'm still slightly shocked it's like i i can't get over it and uh how bad it is. So in that sense, uh, I can speak for myself uh, that I have had my eyes opened. Uh, Ross, I think, has had his eyes open to the plight of the people people in prison because, you know, he, he didn't know anybody in prison. We didn't know anyone. And it's easy to forget them. It's easy not to think about it. It's they're They're locked away. They're shut off. It, and he has seen and talked to pe- so many people who've had such injustices done to them that, um, you know, I, that has certainly impacted him. And of course, just by getting older, he's more mature. He's had to deal with things he never would have dealt with, you know, that none of us deal with unless we're put in a situation. And, um, you know, I, I would say that has matured him. I can certainly say that, uh, you know, they say he's a bad candidate for recidivism, that he's likely to reoffend. That's absurd. He's not that stupid. <laughs> yeah. it's like, you know, he's paid a price. He's learned a lesson. And to, the appellate court went on about that. And I'm like, what? You know, and making that assumption based on nothing, as far as I could tell. And um, I can tell you that's not true. But that doesn't mean he's given up his dedication to liberty and um, belief in it. And neither have I and neither do a lot of people. In fact, that is what our country is supposed to be about. And that's why it's terrible to see his views disparaged in that way, because Mm -hmm. even if it is, even if we're going to abide by the laws that exist and not push against them in this kind of way, though you can argue about if it's good to or not, the majority of people who have libertarian views are not going around and doing anything criminal and they just hold those views from a philosophical perspective and they don't implement them in a way that is actually going against the law. And yet his views were taken to, it seems, sort of suggest that, oh, this will continue to be an issue. He's going to continue to, mm-hmm. you know, he's going to run more drug markets, which is just, I mean, it's silly. But a lot of people do seem to have that perspective of the freedom libertarian community as though they're just standing up for ways to be criminals. And it's mm-hmm. not about philosophy. <laughs> and, it, and, it's, and it's sad to see that kind of disparaging of beliefs. Well, yeah, I mean, think of the absurdity that if he'd gotten the mandatory minimum of 20 years, that in 20 years, not having been on the internet in 20 years, he would come out of there and, oh, I'm going to start another Silk Road. That was cool. Give me a break. It's absurd. That's the only thing they, you know, and they're saying he's going to do it again. I mean, 
and, and in addition, um, as far as libertarians being viewed that way, you know, there's in any kind of group, there's going to be people who are kind of wild and out there that are, but you could throw Thomas Jefferson in there. I mean, what? It's like, really, the libertarian philosophy, if you actually read it, is right in line with our founders. So actually, often, the entity that is breaking the law is the government itself. So, you know, yeah, but I, I know it's and, you know, the media doesn't help in a lot of cases, not all not all media, of course. But um, I believe that a lot of the media get their talking points from the government. They want access to the government and they um, do the government's bidding. I've come to that conclusion based on, you know, my own experience. I've also had the media totally misquote me, take two different video segments and put them together to make a quote that said something totally different. And that was the Wall Street Journal. Um, I've So it's not just, you know, uh, it's respectable media. I've had them seen them distort, sensationalize. So as far as the fake news idea, uh, I, I believe that, yeah, there's plenty of it. There was even a book, I, be, I haven't yes. read it, but there was even a book that yeah. was written about this case, which seemed to focus on the absurd elements of the mm -hmm. prosecution. What was it like having a journalist, I believe, come out and release a book entirely mm -hmm. about your son's activities and totally misrepresent him and just go with the line of the government, which is not mm -hmm. what you would think somebody writing a nonfiction book would be trying to do, of course, that would be naive to believe that there's not an agenda in many cases. Yeah, well, of course, it's very upsetting. I haven't read it either. I've read excerpts and seen all kinds of distortions just in the excerpts, things I personally know directly to be um, distorted and misrepresented and plain out misstatements of fact, like that Ross was a computer programmer. No, he's not a computer programmer. He was Phys he studied physics. I'm not saying he's dumb and doesn't know about computers, but he doesn't know programming languages and he's not averse, you know, very skilled in that. Um, but in any case, it fictionalizes the government narrative and talks about murder for hire as if it's fact. I was told by someone that's on the inside of that industry and I trust, and I have no reason not to trust he, that author and others involved in it. Um, there was a wired two-parter that was same. He was involved in that as well. Uh, was fed information material by the government way before trial. Now I don't know if that's even legal, but I was warned. He, the author, really pushed to have me involved. He kept urging me to be involved, and I was warned, "Don't do it. Their government. They're going to. It's going to be the government narrative." So I didn't. I stayed out of it. And because um, it's, it's hard to know what to do because you want, I want my side told. But then if you know someone has a very strong bias, then you're just going to be giving them publicity and, and actually uh, my validation that's saying this is a good thing. Anyway, uh, basically what I, how I see that book is that um, the, the government couldn't didn't have the confidence to charge Ross with murder for hire in, the, in a trial. So they had this author do it in the court of public opinion. And so, I mean, Vanity Fair did a review of it and they called it a murder mystery as if people were murdered. <laughs> um, and even the title, everything about it is sensationalistic and fictionalized. And I'm not saying there isn't stuff that's true in there. I think it's a mix as far as I can tell from what I've read. But it's it's doing the government's bidding and twisting things. So, I mean, one one that's thing that sticks in my mind was that an excerpt I read, it was like Ross lived in a basement and he was a weirdo. It was like a this dark, dank basement. And and I personally stayed in that basement because Ross owned the house. He was renting rooms upstairs to college, fellow college students. The basement was a finished basement with a carpet and um, an office section. And it was very, it was a basement. It was a finished basement. Now, true, it's not a lie that he was in a basement. <laughs> but I mean, it's a They're distortion. creating this yeah. such you, a silly... Yeah stereotypical hacker view of mm -hmm. him and, and he's not a exactly. hacker it's not even what was being alleged and it totally distorts everything i've ever seen about his life but you know it's for this agenda of the story itself is actually not that interesting somebody set up a website some people used it to engage in sales of all kinds and transactions of all kinds and it was never in the drug market some significant percentage of drug sales true. by any means. Mm -hmm. So true. it was really just some small 
site on the corner of the internet run by somebody who kind of wanted to have a philosophical experiment of sorts. And that's mm. about it. I mean, everything mm. beyond that is largely, as far as what's proven, is sensational. Mm -hmm. That's exact. That's very well put. But I think what alarmed the powers that be is the use of Bitcoin, which at the time hardly anybody knew about. I mean, Ross had told me about Bitcoin when it was under a dollar. And I said, should I get some? And he said, no, mom, it's too volatile. I'm like, OK, bad advice. But in any case, he um, that's where he accumulated all his Bitcoin. He was he was working on a Bitcoin exchange, actually. But um, Chuck Schumer, who's the impetus behind the whole thing, was on the Senate Finance Committee and it came to his attention through a Gawker article. And I think it was the Bitcoin. He said, what the heck is this cur alternate currency? That can't happen. And also, I think the privacy issue, the tour, that it was only available through tour. And I don't think the government likes that. I don't think they said they don't. They even said that anyone uses Tor has criminal intent. They said that in writing in Ross's case. So I think those were issues. That's why I say it's political. I don't think it was about drugs. And I think that it just got all this attention because of Chuck Schumer and the government wanted to make a big deal out of it and shut it down because of the threat of an alternate currency and Tor. That's my personal opinion based on, you know, what we've talked about the sentence, other sentences and all that. Yeah. Digital seems like it's elevated to this silly degree as well, because it's not as though cash is some readily trackable manner of transaction. So Bitcoin is not something that, I mean, if you're trying to figure out the impact that Bitcoin has had on the overall drug market compared to regular cash transactions, it would be minuscule. It's not even a major part of it at all. And the only thing that's different is it's taking place online. I mean, people are not typically buying their drugs with bank accounts linked to their social security number. I mean, there's always some level of protection and privacy. So it's nothing new, but it sounds scary. And I don't know that I see those characterizations of Bitcoin as much nowadays as it used to be. Right. It's much more mainstream now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's re it used to really be focused on the, this is some online currency for buying drugs and, mm -hmm. and whatever else. And it's kind of moved away from that. But still, it is it plays into all these things of illegitimate fears of drugs or illegitimate fears of political philosophies that go against the mainstream or fears of anything taking place online. Just the idea of extra privacy or a way of transferring money, which is not a typical way and it's new and people haven't heard of it. So everybody's trying to figure out what is this? And they'd also, they also don't understand how it works. Granted, people don't tend to understand how our actual money works either. And so it's just, it's a bunch of confusion and fear that seems to contribute to this manner of sentencing and, and to have somebody's life affected by cultural misunderstandings or misinformation is terrible. And as you've repeatedly said, this isn't just about Silk Road or Ross. The reason this case has gotten so much attention is partly because Silk Road was one of the first markets of this kind. But it's also because people have realized this is happening to people on a daily basis, whether it's a Bitcoin angle or a privacy angle or a rights infringement angle or when it comes to drug laws. So if you were to take the lessons that come from this case and continue to come from this case, it impacts a huge portion of America and other countries. So one of the things that has been interesting is the huge response to this. There was a fairly major documentary, Deep Web, and mm -hmm. there's been a lot of coverage. What has it been like to, well, initially have this case start and suddenly your son is facing the situation, but then the story since has been massive community support from so many angles. I mean, drug policy reform, Bitcoin, privacy. What's it been like to have that kind of support? Okay. And once again, I want to answer a couple of things you said. Because you're making very good points. Um, as regards cash, I don't think the government wants us to use cash either. <laughs> I think there's a True. definitely a, a a pressure to a war on cash. And that's a, whole, there's a, that's a whole thing because I think that the government wants to track us as much as possible. And um, so just to say that, but uh, of course it's Cash is a bit more established than Bitcoin, but I think in general, at least and certainly initially, it was an alarming is put set off alarms. Um, I do want to uh, also talk about drug policy um, alliance. Is yeah, you probably know is is having a uh, international conference in Atlanta next week, where I, I will be speaking. 
and um, on a panel doing great work for um, against the drug war. And I really want to make the point, um, and I have made it, you don't have to be for drugs to be against the drug war. This is not about drugs. The drugs drug war is not about drugs, just like Ross's case isn't about drugs. It's just an excuse. I think people really, you know, need to realize that. Um, as far as what has this been like, um, it's been like a surreal nightmare that I can't wake up from, frankly. But um, I do see it also, you know, honestly, if it weren't for Ross being in prison, uh, which is a constant, you know, I always have a, a reservoir of grief about, to be honest. It's just, it's very tough and it does wear away at me. Um, it's been a very um, significant and uh, interesting part of my life. I've been kind of thrust into this spotlight to be able to speak out about things I've seen. Without this situation, nobody would have cared what I had to say. And I do see it almost as an obligation, not only to um, the people in prison that I've met, but also in general to people to wake up and see past the sensationalism of what's really happening in our country. Because I really think we're at a crossroads in history, especially with the onset of the digital age. The government has so much more power to surveil and intrude in our lives now because of technology. And the courts are not keeping up with it. And our Fourth Amendment protections and other, many other constitutional protections are being shredded. And that is going to cause us to lose our freedom. So I kind of see this now as a bigger effort and a bigger cause than just Ross. But of course, I always have Ross in my mind. And um, it's been challenging, but it's um, been a real privilege, too, and an opportunity. You know, sometimes I wake up in the morning and I'm like, is this real? Or am I, if I just had the weirdest, longest dream of my life. But, um, you know, really, it's just you can't make it up. And when you say that the it's not that interesting a story, what the really interesting story is, is what really happened. We only know a tip of the iceberg when it comes to the, the corruption in this case. We do know that tip that there have were definitely corrupt agents all over the site, but there's a whole lot more. They've sealed that a lot of that information. Some of it's just simply undisclosed, unencrypted. And um, there's all kinds of other things going on that we don't even know that I'm sure would be a much more interesting story. And that is basically ignored by most media. And um, certainly the government's not interested in calling attention to it. May very well be the story of not just corruption in this case, but corruption in dark net markets in general that mm -hmm. haven't gone away. And I think after this case, it would be kind of naive to think that corrupt officials uh, and agents are not in some way uh, involved with other markets because it's a small part of the drug market, but it is a large amount of money. I mean, that part of the case is very interesting. And it's not just the couple people. Um, there's no reason to think it's just the couple people who have been named as corrupt in this situation. No. I mean, it's not like <laughs> corrupt officials is a new idea when it comes to drug laws. I mean, they've always existed, but now it's moving into the digital space. And it's even easier in some ways to just as the government would make the argument that this is more concerning because it's easier to hide your activities. It's also easier for the government to hide its activities and to play behind the scenes mm -hmm. and for corruption to play behind the scenes and have very little trace of it. And if you understand, especially if you have the tools of the government, it would be quite easy, presumably, to have some influence on these sites and to potentially steal money. Or who knows when some of these markets have suddenly shut down and taken money with them, exactly who was responsible for those. And it's all speculation, but it is something that people should be more focused on is what is happening in this space of the internet and how much does it have to do with the government? In this case, again, is a very good example of that. You also make a good point about people don't need to be pro-drug in order to view this as an abuse of the legal system. For centuries, people have understood that there can be a difference between your personal beliefs about morality and what you want to put under the government's control. And you don't have to always implement your beliefs in the form of laws. And that's one of the biggest issues that seems to exist nowadays is that anything people view as, you know, I would not do that. I wouldn't want my family to do that. So it must be outlawed. That mm -hmm. doesn't have to exist, even if you're a very religious person or a very, you're subscribed to a very strict ideology. 
you still don't have to implement that in the form of laws. And that's one thing that people, that's the biggest thing people seem to need to understand. And we need to return to as a society is understanding that people have personal views and the public's rules and regulations should be distinct from the whims of any specific group of people. And you really see that in drug laws. Yeah, let me let me make a quick point there, because I think you're making some. Um, Ross and I have talked about this and he said, you know, we all would wish that destructive drugs like heroin, like um, uh, crystal meth didn't exist and hurt people. But to get the government to enforce your wishes is uh, has never worked. Prohibition has never worked. But it's also, you know, to have the government enforce your wishes is a very dangerous thing to do. Uh, and in, in addition, uh, and that's what the drug war is. Uh, in addition, for people who are for it, in addition, the with alcohol prohibition, the government had to um, pass an amendment to prohibit alcohol and then another amendment to make it legal again. They haven't bothered to do that with drugs. They've just given themselves the authority to do this and to uh, go after people. And it's not in the Constitution. It's not in it, it's it's a self-given authority, uh, which is concerning. And then just a couple of other quick points you made um, with the corrupt agents. Yeah, no one's surprised there's corrupt government agents. What to me was shocking was that the jury was not allowed to even know they existed in this case. It came out two months later. The, the defense knew, the prosecution knew, and the judge knew. And the judge said, uh, the prosecution says, oh, we don't want to talk about it at trial. And the judge let them keep it secret from the jury, which to me is outrageous. And the other thing is you talked about uh, that there's lots more dark net markets. One of the things that they justified the sentence with, Ross's sentence, was that it would be a deterrent. And it's had the opposite effect. There actually, there are more and bigger and really badder, quote unquote, dark net markets than before. So anyway, I just want to make those points. People don't seem to understand, even if the founders of the US were not what most people would consider libertarian nowadays, and there were some differences, and obviously they did not all agree either. There was a lot of debate. But one of the key things was that the rights were not coming from the government. They were coming from the people. And the Constitution was more about specifying, I mean, specific rights were outlined, and then specific powers were outlined. But it was also recognized within the Constitution that not everything that the people can do or the states can do is going to be outlined within the document because it would be insane. So there are, Mm -hmm. it's sort of presumed that other forms of freedom are the people's. And therefore, if you're going to infringe upon a specific freedom, you should have an amendment to the Constitution in order to justify that. And that hasn't happened. And I think one of the arguments is that it's an abuse of the Commerce Clause to have a federal drug war. And that may be the case. I don't know enough about it, but it wouldn't be the first time that there is talk about abuses of the Commerce Clause. Yeah, that's a very handy little clause. Mm -hmm. And that's something that people again, just don't really think about, I mean, people don't tend to, in general conversation, think about, oh, prohibition did exist before, and wait, that didn't work, so obviously (laughs) this is nothing new, but also... And it created criminals like cartels now, it created the mafia, same thing, it always does because of the money. Once it's illegal, the price goes up, and nefarious elements get involved. And there's definitely not a deterrent, you're just creating a market for that's filled with money. An attractive market, yes, exactly. And look, they can't even keep drugs out of the prison, you know? And they think they're gonna have a drug war to the general population that's gonna work. Prisons are full of drugs, (laughs) it's a joke. How, I mean, you said that you were not especially pro-government, probably somewhat skeptical of government action before this case, but how has, you know, your perception of the drug war or privacy or anything changed as a result of this firsthand interaction with the abuse of government? It hasn't really changed how I see it because I'm, you know, would like to, I'd like to, look, I know a lot of people don't approve of the constitution that are in the, you know, libertarian space, but if we went back to that, we'd be in really good shape. You know, it's like we'd have a lot more of our freedom Um, I think the average person like me can feel the government encroaching more and more. uh, And I was concerned before. Uh, So it hasn't really changed that basic concern. It's just made brought home to me how real it is. So, you know, it's just made it more 
uh, real. There's, you know, once you see it, you can't go back and go, oh, everything's fine. The government's going to keep me safe and the go and it's so convenient. Let me give it my privacy. I'll just do this. And, you know, it's OK because then I'm safer and and not see what's really behind it. And um, I hope people are, see, are seeing it. I'm, I fear that a lot of them don't. And it's not fun to think about. I don't like to think about it. I mean, you know, but if we don't pay attention, you know, it's happened not that long ago in history and actually now that we will lose our freedom. And then we, it's very hard to get it back. I, it may be too late. It may not. I hope not. But I do think we're at a tipping point, And especially with the digital age, like I was saying before, I think we have a choice. Are we going to go down the cross? You know, if we're at a crossroads, are we going to take the path to more innovation, more liberty, more freedom? and personal responsibility, or are we going to take the path to more government intrusion, control, and, um, you know, which are we going to do? Because it's we're really kind of at this kind of crossroads here. And if it tips to the government's control, I, I think it's going to get faster and faster and more uh, encroaching. What can people do to help? I know donations are a big thing and sharing information. You know, it's a very tricky situation that Ross is now in and hopefully trying to go to the Supreme Court works, but what can individual people do? Because I think a lot of communities are are affected by this case. And Yeah. Um, well, we have freeross.org, our website. Um, and, you know, I have, there's, like you mentioned, donations. There's also a tax deductible option. There's um, a, an art game based on Ross's art that for a dollar, you can chip in a dollar and play the game. Um, there's, uh, if you buy an Amazon through our site, we get a little something from that and it doesn't cost you anything. There's also an action page. At, uh, we talked about the narrative that has smeared Ross's name and never been proven or, or brought to trial and that he denies. And, um, you know, spreading the narrative, helping in comments on articles, you know, just uh, retweeting me, sharing our Facebook page. We have a free Ross community page, uh, liking it or whatever you do on <laughs> Facebook, um, you know, like the page, um, and, and share it, share posts, that kind of thing. Really social media has a, you know, of course a huge reach. There's a volunteer option that if you have skills, connections, I really want to start networking with groups that are um, working towards more criminal, you know, better criminal justice system and against the drug war and uh, if contacts within groups, suggestions of groups. Uh, I hope to do that at in Atlanta with the Drug Policy Alliance's Reform Conference just to, you know, we need to work together because we're up against a very formidable opponent, which is the government. They're They're enormous and they're rich and they, you know, so I'm trying to spread out that way. And any help with that would be great. So there's all kinds of ways at all kinds of levels. It doesn't have to be money, but we always need money because that's, we have some very expensive things coming in, up in the future. But, and that's how the government also crushes people is financially. It's very hard to fight. We've had some tremendous support and grassroots support. So freeross.org has all kinds of um, options. And you can always contact me through it by email or I have Twitter and there is a way to write to Ross there on the contact page. So just knowing that there's people out there like you uh, that see the big picture and understand the implications means a lot. So any of that would be helpful. Great. Well, I will link to the social media and the website. And thank you for coming on. Oh, yeah. and, My pleasure. It was great. And I wish you and Ross the best. Thanks a lot, Seth. Yeah, it was really good.